I'll begin this afternoon's session with a brief introduction. Welcome to the Canadian Institute of Forestry's National Electronic Lecture Program. My name is Sharon Yang, and I will be hosting today's session. Today is Wednesday, February 28th, 2024, and this is the fourth session in the e-lecture series entitled Sharing Knowledge on Some Key Initiatives Happening Across the Canadian Forest Service. The series is brought to you by the Canadian Forest Service and Canadian Wood Fiber Centre. The CIFIFC is very pleased to collaborate and host these webinars. For today's session, we are very pleased to have Andre Arsenault and Kendrick Brown, who will give an exciting presentation titled Exploring Ecological Change in Western and Northern Canada. To kick things off, Andre is a forest ecologist studying patterns of disturbance ecology and biodiversity using paleoecology, experimental and observational approaches to inform better forest planning, management, and policy in Canada. Kendrick is a research scientist with Natural Resources Canada. He uses paleoecological approaches to examine ecological and fire regime change through time in response to various drivers. With that, I will now pass it over to Andre. Thank you, Sharon, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, and uh, thanks to CIF for organizing this. And um, yes, yeah, so today we're exploring change. I, I will focus first on the disturbance ecology uh, aspects of change. Of course, natural disturbances are really important drivers of change. And we can describe them, them uh, describe them using different types of characteristics, like the type of disturbance where you're looking at wildfire, insect outbreaks, so on. And then there's a whole bunch of metrics that are quite important, like the timing, the season the, it, it happens, the frequency, the extent, uh, severity, how much fuel or biomass is removed, and of course a synergy between these disturbances, like for example the the interaction between wildfire and bark beetle. But um, why study natural disturbances and what are the advantages of using uh, paleoecology? Well, the, the really key thing here is that um, paleoecology allows us to get knowledge on processes that have affected species and ecosystems over time. And that is really uh, fundamental to develop baseline on historical conditions, uh, get an idea of natural range of variation, of uh, ecosystem processes, and that's key to sustainable forest management and ecosystem management. And this can actually avoid us, uh, avoid um, uh, creating ecosystem simplification and degradation, and provided we get the story right, it can also help us develop guidelines for ecosystem restoration. But the key thing here is getting that story right. And uh, also, you know, with, with uh, everything that's happening with climate change, uh, this type of approach can help us anchor models of uh, future climate change scenarios using robust climate uh, disturbance ve vegetation analyses uh, with this uh, paleo approach. And of course, historically, it has helped us anticipate future disturbances. So, you know, this has been one of the important bases for the development of the Canadian forest by behavior prediction uh, system. But, you know, there are some caveats here. There, there are some challenges in using paleoecology, and each approach has intrinsic limitation in terms of uh, inference and applications. And so, for example, if you look at fire scar trees, they have very, vo very valuable information to precise, uh, precisely date a uh, year of fires and even sometimes season at the individual tree locations. But uh, using that information alone is not enough to infer spatial extent and fire effects, like the severity of these events, the fuel removal, effects on forest structure is problematic. Um, I should go back and say, you know, the solution to those uh, challenges, of course, is to use multiple approaches, and I'll get to that uh, in a little bit. So what I'd like to do now is give a few examples. I'll start with... Uh, um, uh, something that we did in uh, Newfoundland and Labrador. So in 2016, we did a fairly comprehensive synthesis of uh, natural disturbances uh, on the island of Newfoundland. 
And uh, our conclusion was that it was mostly a complex disturbance regime driven by insects and uh, really long wildfire intervals. For the island, it was 770 years. And in, in that paper that actually was published in the Forestry Chronicle, we challenged Parks Canada in terms of their uh, assumption they were using uh, for fire management in the Terra Nova National Park which was based on an assessment they, uh, in the 1980s based on uh, stand dates from tree rings. And they calculated at that time a fire cycle of 97 years, which they use as a basis for um, justifying prescribed burning in the park. So this actually triggered two studies. There was a soil charcoal study by Leah Walker at Munn with uh, Carissa Brown. And then there was another study uh, using lake sediments uh, by Nick Lake, who did his master's with me and Les Swinar at, at UNB. And I'll just show quickly some of the results there by, by Nick. But you can see all the variation in terms of the fire, the charcoal in the sediment uh, and, um, and the, uh, the fire frequency. And for the, the contemporary vegetation type, um, the fire return interval was 271 years, which was significantly longer than what uh, the baseline uh, Parks Canada was using. And incidentally, it's interesting because although Leah used a different approach, they also had significantly longer uh, fire interval using the soil charcoal approach. Now, what I would like to do is uh, go into a very different system. And so uh, this is the uh, the dry belt of uh, the southern interior of British Columbia in the mid 1990s in the biodiversity guidebook. The BC government classified this uh, these ecosystems, you know, the bunch grass zone, the interior Douglas fir zone, bundles of pine zone as fire maintained ecosystem. And so what that meant was that the idea was that the fire a uh, regular low severity fire would maintain these systems in open conditions. And uh, after fire suppression, uh, these forests increase in terms of density um, and, and fuel arrangement, creating ladder fuel more sensitive to, or more conducive to uh, crown fire. And so what, what we actually did is, uh, and the key point here is I, I want to um, emphasize the importance of using different types of uh, lines of evidence to try to test these kinds of assumptions. So on the, on the top left there, you have different uh, data uh, using fire weather and looking at how that correspond to, uh, uh, to incidents of fire. And you know, in the southern interior, most of the fires happen in July and August, and they're uh, often associated with, with uh, dry drought conditions. And the other thing we looked at um, is actually historical conditions uh, from historical reports from the BC Forest Service uh, that were in the era that would have been before effective fire suppression. And uh, what we found, it was that we didn't have one condition of uh, open uh, forest. Uh, these reports describe a whole bunch of different types of forest structure condition. And uh, finally, there's two other things that are interesting in terms of that uh, and that system is that uh, at the top right there, you have work that was done by one of our master's student, uh, Rochelle Campbell, that shows that fire is not the only disturbance affecting these forests in the southern interior. Western spruce budworm is actually quite important as a major effect on the forest structure as well. And, and finally, you know, the idea that uh, fuel has been accumulating after fire suppression over the, the last 50, 70 years. Um, it, it, you, you need to look at this in the context that there's a whole bunch of things happening in that system as well. So uh, the bottom right here, you've got a um, uh, map of the Kamloops forest region uh, showing on the left wildfire patterns and on the uh, right uh, harvesting pattern from 1950, 1996. And uh, there's no question that fire suppression had an effect on, on different uh, areas. But the other reality is with harvesting, we removed a hell of a lot of fuel from those uh, forests. And then what I'd like to do is just show you a little bit of work uh, that we've done on um, uh, fire history using tree rings. And uh, this is from the 
uh, Arrowstone Park, uh, close to Cash Creek. And we had different uh, grad sex looking at uh, age structure and fire scars. And essentially what we found was that uh, between 1585 and 2006, depending how you calculate fire frequency, it doesn't really matter, but there was a lot of uh, variation in terms of the frequency, uh, both spatially and temporally. And uh, uh, it, a lot of the dominant fires that we saw in this watershed were actually associated with dry years. Um, one that stands out is 1869. The interesting thing about 1869 is that it's actually uh, one of the driest years um, on record based on, on tree ring analysis. And it's also a, a year that was recorded, one, one of the first recorded years um, in terms of uh, reports uh, in the Hudson's Bay report for Fort Candles. And it actually describes um, very dry, hot and dry conditions from the spring to the fall, a lot of smoke in the skies and, and a lot of wildfire. And that also corresponds to a lot with stands that have initiated in the Kamloops area. And you actually see that too in the Arrowstone watershed. So you can see there was a major cohort that uh, started um, following that 1869 fire event with a major cohort of uh, regenerating lodgepole pine and uh, Douglas fir. And so these firestorms or mega fires have actually happened in the past, suggesting that, that that low severity model actually is not supported by any of the data that we've presented to you so far. Um, and you know the, these uh, high severity fires, as you know, are still happening. So actually the Arrowstone Park, uh, uh, a portion of it was burnt um, after the 2017 Elephant uh, Mountain uh, Fire. Now, this is uh, uh, another study from uh, Opax Mountain, just uh, uh, north of Kamloops. And uh, uh, Kendrick will talk about that a little bit more from a paleo perspective. But um, essentially, when you look at the height of fire scars, or, or again, the mean fire return interval, it again shows you a lot of variation at, uh, at different scales. But to all this, I have an important caveat. So, you know, in, in the mid 2000, um, I worked with uh, Mana Jules and the elders of the uh, Shakopmuk uh, Cultural and Language Society. And they helped us actually translate uh, um, a brochure that we did for interpretive trail uh, for the OPAX Mountain Project. And uh, I think at the time, you know, that was a really good thing for us to do. But one of the things that we have not, done yet, and I think it's a big gap. Uh, it's actually trying to work with the Shepkokmuk people and other indigenous people to try to understand their perspective on fire, cultural burning, and um, and values, and how indigenous people manage the system. And I think that integration of science and indigenous knowledge is uh, something that that is uh, uh, very important. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to make uh, progress uh, in the near future on this. The other thing which is happening, of course, um, this is a, a graph for the Kamloops map sheet uh, area burn from you know, uh, 1919 to 2017. And in blue, you can see uh, fires from anthropogenic origin. And the thing that stands out there, of course, is the 2017 fire which uh, we, uh, excuse me, which was obviously uh, related to, uh, uh, was related to a, uh, a, oh, excuse me. Uh, uh, anyway, I'm trying to shut that up. Okay, sorry about that. Anyway, um, uh, so it, it was anthropogenic origin and you can see that these uh, these fires, there seem to be a trend with um, uh, warming temperature, drought, and these uh, cumulative impact of anthropogenic origin and um, and, uh, and and climate change. So um, 
with that, I think what's really important is to try to look at what was a longer perspective, historical perspective um, on these fires. And uh, Kendrick will be able to talk to that with his expertise on the paleoecology. So with that, thank you very much. Okay, I'm just gonna share a screen here. Uh, one second. Sorry, hang on. Can you see my screen now? Um, not yet. For Looks example. like it's still sharing. Oh, you know what? You I, think I, I think I chose the uh, the PDF. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna stop. That was the one I sent to you. Just give me one sec. Let yeah, me no close worries. that because it's confusing me. Uh, okay, there. And share screen. I just have to find my talk here. It's hidden on me. Where did it go? Huh. Show all windows. Okay, there. That'll help. Share. Oh, that's way back. Hold on. Okay, I'm almost there, folks. Uh, I just got to get rid of this black box at the top so I can, how do I get rid of this thing now so I can start the slideshow? Okay, from beginning there. Okay, yeah. Okay, thanks, Andre. Sorry about that, everyone. Thanks, Andre, for that intro into your research program with stuff from Newfoundland to BC. Um, uh, and your use of uh, fire scars and, and tree rings. So, um, you know, Andre presented some insights that can be gleaned using, you know, tree rings at sort of the centennial scale. And we're going to pivot here now to look at ecosystem and ecosystem dynamics over longer time scales. So multi-centennial, millennial, or even longer. Um, and basically, my portion of the talk, I'm just going to spend a few minutes introducing paleoecology, what it is and how we do it. Then I want to provide some examples from some research we've done in the interior of BC, Yukon, and the Canadian Arctic. And then wrap up with just an example of how we're actually using paleoecology to help inform sort of management and management decisions. So, you know, as the name implies, paleo is old and ecology. So paleoecology is the science where we look at ecology of the past or ecology through time. And the overarching goal is to look at the origin, evolution, and dynamics of ecosystems through time. Um, and to do so, we rely on a whole suite of different lines of evidence, whether, you know, it's, it's, so it's, it's a multidisciplinary sort of field of study where we rely on biological proxies, physical proxies, chemical proxies, climatological proxies, and, and many others. And, and the only other sort of thing I want to note here is that, um, you know, in addition to sort of having this long time perspective, we also can have different spatial perspectives. So if you go out and you core one site, you get a local sort of perspective. If you core two or three sites, you can start building a regional perspective. If you collate more sites, you can get um, you know, national or hemispheric or even global perspectives. So there's that, that uh, element there of, of spatial as well as temporal perspectives. Um, so how does it work? Well, the first thing we do is you know, we go out and we do field work as well as laboratory work and this collage here. Can, I, can you see my mouse? Can I use that as a pointer? Yeah? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, we can go out and 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 we do this field work and in this collage, you can just see our coring platform and you know our 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 team acquiring different sediment cores. And I affectionately refer to these cores as nature's archives. And so, you know, basically like if you have a lake basin, and it doesn't have to be a lake basin, you can sample a soil or alluvium or a wetland. There's all sorts of different environments as long as material is accumulating. You know, I affectionately refer to these as nature's diary. So you can imagine like every year 
you have these depressions in the landscape, like a lake and the landscape around it or the ecosystem or, you know, things related to ecosystem processes, they're shedding information about what they're doing into that lake basin. And it's, it's accumulating there and it's being recorded there. And so we're the detectives that come along and extract that signal and try and figure out what it means. And so just here's a picture of a sediment core with organic sediment separated by a volcanic ash that erupted 7,000 years ago. And then what we can do is we can sample those cores and we can sample them for physical, chemical, and biological indicators of landscapes, climate systems, ecosystems, ecosystem processes. And the point being, the further you go down in your core, the further back in time you go. And so if I'm talking about something that happened 10,000 years ago, don't get discouraged by the time it's really like the important thing here is that you're developing a high quality time series. And in fact, the longer the time, the better, because it allows you to look at sort of more variation in nature and get a better appreciation for how these systems operate and respond to different forcing mechanisms. So, you know, uh, so we'll extract all of these different proxies and then we will analyze them and interpret them. And so, for example, in this case, you know, we might be seeing lots of grass pollen in the bottom of the core and say, hey, it was a warm, dry climate with grasslands, whereas the top, maybe it got, you know, wetter and more forested. So you can start sort of piecing together elements of the story there. Um, so one of the things I'll just quickly, you know, go over pollen analyses because it's one of the main proxies that I work with. So every year, you know, plants and ecosystems produce a lot of pollen as part of their reproductive um, uh, cycle. Pollen is produced in the male cones of gymnosperms and in the anthers of angiosperms. And critically, most of that pollen does not fulfill its reproductive potential. It gets mixed in the air and some canopy winds. So, it, you know, it gets into the atmosphere and it rains out over the landscape. And we've all experienced this in the spring when you come out to go to work and your car is covered in this sort of light yellow dusting of material. That's pollen that didn't fulfill its reproductive potential. Um, some of that pollen rains out on your car. Some of that pollen rains out into lakes where it accumulates in the lake sediment. And this is a picture I took from a site in Romania 25 years ago, and you can see the pollen accumulating on the lake surface. That pollen represents the vegetation around the lake 25 years ago. It has sunk through the water column. It's in the sediment now, and it is a record of what the vegetation looked like 25 years ago. So we can go out and core these lakes, extract the pollen. Pollen's made up of a durable polymer called sporopollenin. It, it's ornate with a lot of structure, so we can use the pollen to reconstruct vegetation to the family, genus, and species levels. And, you know, that's sort of what this is depicting. Once you've reconstructed the vegetation, you can make inferences about climate if you understand the sort of climatic tolerances of the vegetation you're seeing. Or we can develop pollen, um, you know, climate transfer functions to more quantitatively look at how climate has changed through time. And likewise, paleo fire. So, you know, fire is a little bit different than pollen in that it's episodic. So every year, you know, plants will produce pollen, but in a fire, they're not burning every year. So what you'll see in the sedimentary record is a pulse of charcoal that coincides with the fire. Then you might have a series of samples representing a number of years with no charcoal. Then you'll have another fire with a pulse of charcoal. So if you think of combustion sort of as the I don't know, the process in which a fuel is heated, ignited, and burned. The way charcoal is formed is in that heating phase um, that just the heat alone and the absence of flame will start breaking down wood. Cellulose starts charring. So when you apply heat to wood or any organic material, we see this if you burn something in your oven, for example. But if you apply heat to organic material, you'll start altering its structure and its form. Um, Charcoal or uh, cellulose starts charring at about 200 degrees Celsius and lignin starts charring at about 280 to 500 degrees Celsius. So you apply heat, you create this sort of pyrolytic charring front. If it goes through complete combustion, of course, your byproducts are CO2 and water. But in fires, there's a lot of incomb incomplete combustion that occurs. And so this material that gets charred can get lofted up into a smoke plume like the pollen, it gets mixed in the atmosphere, it rains out, we can collect the core, you know, and this one's just showing sort of symbolic symbolically these charcoal bands, and we can reconstruct fire history. Um, 
in the early days, sort of 20, 30 years ago, it was really, yeah, is there charcoal or not? And does that suggest that there was fire or not? But the disciplines come a long ways since then. And so we're actually now able to reconstruct different elements of, of historic fire regimes. So one of the things we can reconstruct is frequency and return intervals. So this is time on the x-axis from present day, going back 10,000 years. And this upper panel, this black histogram, that's just showing the concentration or flux of charcoal that was counted in a sediment core, sample to sample going back through time. And so the way we look, the way we sort of reconstruct frequency and return intervals is the first thing we do is we apply a, a smoothing algorithm to the time series. And this just represents, it's a, it represents sort of the low frequency component of charcoal production that's not necessarily related to individual fire events. And so it, it captures sort of the differential sort of long-term production of charcoal on the landscape, the transport of charcoal, and then importantly, the reworking of charcoal. So if you subtract this low frequency component from the time series, you're left with this high frequency residual component. And then we have a bunch of sort of, you know, quantitative statistical approaches whereby we can evaluate if each one of these peaks is big enough and sort of you know, on its own enough to be classified as a fire event. And if it is, you, you can see the fire events that are coming out positive are marked by these black uh, crosses at the top. And then because we radiocarbon date our cores, we can say, well, you know, there's, we can convert sort of the, the difference in depth between fire events to ages between fire events. And once you've done that, you can start saying something about fire uh, return intervals, or you can, you know, alternatively, you can look at it from a frequency domain and say, okay, well, how many fires are there per thousand years? And you can trace fire frequency through time. Uh, we're also making inroads into understanding what actually burned in the past, and that's being done sort of using two approaches. So one is people are burning reference material that you can then compare to your fossilized material. And so in this upper panel, you can see A through C, you know, you have these types of charcoal, with sort of rectangular cells running in parallel ridges with stomata. This is a more graminoid type charcoal, whereas in D and E, you can see the charcoal, it may be hard to see, but hopefully you can make it out with these bordered pits, which allow water transport in wood. So this is derived from coniferous sources. Uh, in panels F and in G, you can see that it's sort of veiny, leafy. So this is deciduous charcoal and then H, you know, it doesn't sort of exhibit any cellular structure. It's more kind of amorphous and, you know, with metallic or submetallic cluster. This is resin, pitch wax, this sort of stuff. And then, it, so, you know, we can look at what's actually burning if you keep track of what you're seeing in terms of charcoal in your fossilized samples. And the other thing you can do is you can measure the dimensions of charcoal grains as you're going. And this is just a simple plot showing that graminoid charcoal on average, the mean is sort of typically greater than three in terms of length width ratios. So they're kind of long, narrow, skinny pieces where shrub and tree charcoal is much more blocky. In addition to frequencies, return intervals and fuels, we're also making inroads on um, uh, looking at fire severity and erosion. And this is being done using two proxies, Delta N15, which is a ratio of nitrogen 15 to nitrogen 14. In high severity fires, because nitrogen 14 has one less neutron, that's preferentially removed from the system and you get enrichment in Delta N15. And likewise, if you have a really high severity fire, um, one, fires can induce magnetism. They convert sort of these weakly magnetic minerals in the soils to strongly magnetic minerals. Um, and then two, if you remove a lot of forest floor and you expose the mineral soil, there might be some magnetic material there. That all then gets eroded and deposited into basins downstream post-fire and you'll get a magnetic signal. So basically we get the sediment core and we apply a magnetic field to it and we can look at how the sediment uh, responds to that magnetic field. And in so doing, we can identify, you know, layers that are more magnetic versus less magnetic. And that's helping us reconstruct severity and erosion. So now, because this is CIF, I thought one thing I would quickly do, this is based on work by Dyke in 2005, but it's, I don't know if you've seen this paper, but it's a really nice paper. Um, and I just want to go through a series of events or, or slides here that show how the Canadian landscape has changed through time uh, with time in the top right here. So this is just a shot from 21 to 17,000 years ago. 
And what you can see is Canada was covered in ice at that time. We had two ice sheets, the Laurentide ice sheet in the east and the Cadillaran ice sheet in the west. And critically, and I just want you to think about this, during full glacial conditions, climate was four, or sorry, climate was six degrees colder than today. Under RCP 4.5, we're talking about sort of two to three degrees warming in 100 years. In RCP 8.5, we're talking about four degrees. I mean, so, you know, with, with anthropogenic warming in just a, a century, century and a half, you're talking about warming the planet sort of half to two thirds equivalent to what the planet did naturally through changes in orbital geometries and internal nonlinear nonlinear feedbacks uh, during the glaciation. You know, so six degrees colder, natural. You know, changes in orbital geometries versus 150 years of anthropogenic, anthropogenic CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions warming the planet sort of half to two thirds of that, but in the opposite direction. It's it's mind boggling, and you know, just six degrees warmer. Look at Canada. We were under two to three kilometers of ice. Where was the vegetation? The vegetation, and, and I put these labels on, if you work in a particular vegetation type, you can sort of follow the, the, the evolution of your biome of interest. But the vegetation was located south of the ice. It was up in Beringia, lots of shrub and herb tundra. And then because there was so much ice in the landscape, global sea levels were about 120 meters lower than present. And lots of sort of the grand banks off the Maritimes actually were supported new emergent islands that were, uh, you know, characterized by tundra. The other thing that happened at this time is because there was so much ice, the polar, the, the jet stream got deflected to the south and lakes the size, you know, that are occurring in sort of relatively dry areas today um, were, they received a lot more precipitation. And, and so you have Lake Bonneville here, which is the precursor to Salt Lake City and Lake La Henta here in Nevada, you know, these were big lakes that were receiving a lot of precipitation because of the lowering uh, of the jet stream in terms of latitude there. By 14,000 years ago, you know, orbital geometries had changed, the ice started to melt. And a couple things to point out here, uh, one, you know, an ice-free corridor formed between the Laurentide and the Cotillion Ice Sheet, and two, coastal British Columbia became ice-free. So, you know, people have proposed these as two routes for the peopling of the Americas. In terms of vegetation in Canada, we have tundra going through that ice-free corridor, a bunch of sort of tundra-like systems uh, on the coast. But you can see that the boreal forest is migrating into southern Manitoba and Saskatchewan and grasslands to Saskatchewan and Alberta. Um, now, as the planet was warming, there was an internal nonlinear feedback mechanism, which actually caused a thousand years of cooling in response to that overall warming trend. And what this happened between about 13 and 12,000 years ago. And basically what happened here is there was this massive lake called Lake Agassiz. And this is sort of its total extent through time. And that water in this lake was typically draining down the Mississippi River into the Gulf of Mexico. But at, but at 13,000 years ago, it actually got redirected out the St. Lawrence Seaway. And we had this massive pulse of fresh water, which an, entered the North Atlantic Ocean. And it slowed down thermal haline circulation. And that resulted in a thousand years of cooling. And so that's one concern with global warming is, is the Greenland ice sheet melts, that there might be enough fresh water entering the North Atlantic Ocean to actually cool down the North Atlantic. And so places like Scandinavia may actually experience some cooling going forward, even though the planet is warming. Uh, the other thing that happened at this time is the Canadian landscape in terms of fauna looked profoundly different. So we had mastodons, woolly mammoths, woolly rhinoceros, saber-toothed cats, lions, jaguars. Um, yeah, what else? You know, giant cave-faced bears, giant beavers, uh, horses, camel this Pleistocene megafauna went extinct. The ice was melting. And so you can see at this point in time, so, uh, Asia and North America now are no longer joined. And then between about 12,000 and, and um, I can't see my cursor there. So I, oh, and 4,000. Um, North America actually experiences what's known as its thermal maximum. So our warmest temperatures sort of in the last you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 years. 
And warming didn't occur uniformly everywhere. It occurred first in Western Canada and later in Eastern Canada due to residual effects of the larger Laurentide ice sheet. But a couple things to point out here, like in British Columbia, you had maximum grassland and dry forest expansion at this time. And in Southern Canada, the plains reached their maximum extent. And then in the last 4,000 years, uh, the modern configuration of the Canadian landscape develops. We get, you know, cooler, wetter conditions, widespread development of, of uh, wetlands. Uh, you know, a few climatic oscillations, the medieval climatic anomaly when, when Vikings colonized Greenland, the Little Ice Age when those colonies failed. Europeans settled in North America, impacting landscapes and indigenous practices. And then within just the last 100, 150 years, anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. So now what I want to do is just show um, some of the work that we're doing in the interior of British Columbia for reference here is Vancouver. Uh, Andre was talking about some of his uh, research up in and around Kamloops. So together with Andre, we've cored a lake called Mud Lake, and I just want to present some preliminary data from that. Then we'll go about 100 kilometers southeast, and I'll show some results from uh, Kelowna. We've also collected a core in Invermere uh, with incredibly dramatic ecological uh, and climate uh, record, just really big ecological changes evident at this site in response to climate forcing. We're just starting to work on that site too, but I, I can just tell from sort of the sedimentary profile we're looking at. Um, so this is Mud Lake. Uh, it's at about a thousand meters elevation. Uh, Andre has a bunch of uh, tree uh, rings and fire scars from around this site. Um, and again, we're just you know, we haven't done the pollen work yet. We're doing the charcoal work, but just looking at, and we have a few radiocarbon dates. So I know this is about four or 5,000 years and we're back about 8,000 years in our development of our time series. But just looking at this, you can see that there's lower charcoal here versus here. Uh, and we'll do the statistical analyses to show that, but I think that's gonna come out. And, you know, so maybe what we're seeing just in terms of charcoal is a change from under past warmer, drier conditions a prevailing surface fire regime into cooler, wetter conditions with more sort of forests and biomass available and larger charcoal counts. And, and if we go to Shannon Lake in and around Kelowna, which currently is located in the Ponderosa Pine zone with uh, uh, Douglas Fir nearby, I'm just going to take you through this diagram because it's a pretty interesting record of quite dramatic ecological and fire regime change through time. And so this is, a, this is known as a pollen diagram. We have depth and we have age, which is based on radiocarbon dates that were sampled throughout this core. Um, so you can see our record goes from present day. This is where we live all the way back to 11,000 years. And what have we learned from this site? Well, the first thing you can see that there's lots of lodgepole pine pollen. The lodgepole pine is a prolific producer of pine and it's overrepresented in the pollen record. There is lodgepole pine on the landscape at this time as we're coming out of uh, full glacial conditions, but it, you can see in the long term it's decreasing in abundance. But what we what we do see is abundant grass and artemisia, and then importantly, selaginella, a good indicator of sort of open, dry conditions. And so, uh, you know, the grass, artemisia, or, or sagebrush, and Slaginella makes me believe that this was a hot, dry interval. And indeed, like when we look down our, at our pollen uh, slides and in a field of view, you can see this sample contains abundant quartz. So that's telling me that not only, you know, do we have sort of this non-arboreal dominated landscape, but it was windy and arid and dusty. And there's a lot of quartz accumulating in the lake at this time. And in fact, Ali in a paper, I forget what journal it was published in, but anyway, it's a really good paper, I thought. You can see that he shows these dune fields. Here's the Stoss and Lee side. So the dunes migrating sort of in the direction towards the hills, right? But this is a dune that was active in the interior of British Columbia in the past, just 11 to 9,000 years ago when climate was hot and dry. Now, from about 9,000 to 5,000 years ago, you can see that law or that ponderosa pine pollen starts to increase, but we still have abundant grass and sagebrush. So I think what's happening here is we kind of have a landscape that's still very open and non-arboreally dominated, but yeah, maybe it's starting to look a little bit savanna-like with scattered pine trees. I still think that climate is hot and dry. 
And if you contrast that to the last sort of 5,000 years, here you can see Pinus woodlands develop very strongly. You can see the interior Douglas fir zone develop and other arboreal elements are increasing. Artemisia is decreasing. So I think what's happening here is we're seeing a decrease in temperature of, yeah, I don't know, one, two, three, four degrees, an increase in precipitation of several hundred millimeters. And that's allowing sort of the arboreal system to thrive uh, and the non-arboreal to contract somewhat. So, you know, what does this mean? Well, you know, at the very top, we have anthropogenic warming. So as we warm, are we going to actually take this system, which has persisted for about 5,000 years, and sort of convert maybe back into something like this, which occurred under past warmer and drier climatic conditions? And what about fire? Oh, and I should just say also in the upper part of the record here, when we look at our pollen slides, much less quartz. So as the, as the site became forested, the landscape stabilized, and less wind blowing dusty environments. What about fire? Well, here you can see, and this is, we've analyzed the fire record here at two millimeters. It's one of the highest resolution charcoal records. And I'm just getting ready to start writing it up and interpreting it more deeply. Uh, but anyway, two millimeters, one of the most highly uh, high resolution records probably globally. And what you can see is very low charcoal counts during these periods of hot, dry past climate with a non-arboreal system likely reflecting surface fires and then as the system became forested, you can see much more charcoal accumulating in response to this increase in biomass, probably a combination of crown and surface fires. Uh, we haven't decomposed this, so I can't say anything about uh, return intervals, but we will do the classic sort of char analyses as well as some um, FOIA analyses and wavelets to extract, to, to not only look at it from a time perspective, but also in the frequency domain. Uh, and then just going up into high elevation, this is interesting too. So this is McCulloch Reservoir at, at or McCulloch Lake at almost 1300 meters elevation. This is in the montane spruce zone. And I don't want to spend a lot of time because I have more to get through here. But just in the past, we have this hot dry interval, which coincides to the hot dry interval we saw at the lower elevation Shannon Lake. And you can see here that there's grass and sage and ponderosa pine actually occurring at high elevations. Uh, in the interior of British Columbia that today are characterized by montane spruce and Engelmann spruce subalpine fir systems. So very hot and dry. And then, of course, you know, this is close to Shannon Lake, so it's been subjected to the same sort of long-term climate changes. So decreasing temperatures, increasing precipitation. And when that happens at about 7,000 years ago, you can see the spruce forest develop, the fir forest, the Engelmann spruce, are developing at slightly higher elevation, the interior Douglas fir forest at slightly lower elevation, but it becomes much more forested. And at our site, we have uh, completed the decomposition here of the charcoal. And again, you can see it's much like the lower site, very little charcoal in the system, implying sort of, you know, maybe a surface fire, patchy surface fires in the past when climate was hot and dry. And then fires really sort of take off here in terms of the amount of charcoal. The mean fire return interval is about 300 years in the montane zone uh, over the last 7,000 years uh, as climate cooled and moistened. So again, for the montane forests in British Columbia, as we warm, are we going to see sort of a reversion sort of back to these more non-arboreal type systems? Um, so now I want to just show you some work that we've done in the Yukon. Uh, in the boreal cadillaran zone. These colored lines here are isopols. They're showing the migration of lodgepole pine north. So it was in northern BC 12,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, kind of enters the Yukon between seven and 6,000 years ago. Migrates north across the Yukon over the last four or 5,000 years. And just it's just starting to arrive at our sites within the last thousand years. So I'm just going to show, we've cored four sites. I'm just going to show results from one of them for the sake of time. Um, so again, a pollen diagram, depth and age on the y-axis, species abundance on the x-axis. And one thing you'll notice here is our records only go back about 6,000 years. So to understand sort of what happened, you know, in the, in, in the preceding millennia when climate was warm and dry due to, or warmer anyway, due to orbital geometries, I just looked at some surrounding pollen records that were, you know, not close, but at least within the region. And, and sort of looking at a few of those, you know, the early part of the, the record in the Yukon was sort of dominated by white spruce and birch and the idea is that it was drier. I think our site, it, it, it's a small basin and it's conceivable that under this drier climate that 
you know, the site dried out completely. We hit something very hard at the bottom. So maybe it was just too dry, you know, to, yeah, and it just didn't hold water. I don't, I don't know. But anyway, you know, what our site does show over the last 6,000 years is that, you know, Picea has been pretty constant, you know, there's some variability, but birch has been pretty constant. So boreal forest has certainly persisted in the boreal cadillaran zone for six, 7,000 years. This Picea curve is a composite of white and black spruce. So we went back and we teased, there's differences in the pollen in terms of the size and the ornamentation and reticulation. So we partitioned it into black and white spruce. And what you can see is black spruce shown by this red line increase through time and then sort of, you know, establish itself at sort of, you know, a constant level near the top of the core. So this increase in black spruce we're going from a dry climate. Um, it might reflect an increase in effective moisture there, allowing black spruce to expand across the landscape. And you know, if we look at other sort of more subtle signal in the pollen record, you can see Meriophyllum. Um, oh, what is that? Uh, it's not milfoil. It's uh, quillwort, I believe. Anyway, it it uh, occurs in sort of one to two meters of water, and so maybe this elevated uh, mariophyllum signal reflects rising water levels in the basin, which is consistent sort of with the expansion of black spruce and an increase in effective moisture. So precipitation doesn't really increase a whole lot, but temperatures cool. And so the land surface sort of overall moistened. Uh, and then just moving up, you know, over the last 4,000 years, we can see an increase in cyperaceae implying widespread pollutification and sphagnum spores implying, you know, increased acidity and, and wet and it wetening. So maybe it reflects, again, decreasing temperatures and increasing precipitation. Um, and then there's the, the pine signal capturing the arrival and local expansion of pine around our sites within the last 5,000, 500 to 1,000 years. So what about fire? I'm just going to take you through a few things here. So here's that expansion of black spruce. So again, this is this is now rotated 90 degrees. So we have time on the uh, x-axis from present day to 6,000 years ago. Um, so we have this expansion of black spruce. Again, uh, an increase in effective moisture driven largely by slight cooling. Um, and then what do we see in terms of fire? Well, we see that actually our shortest fire return intervals occur at this time of increasing effective moisture, but black spruce expanding. And so, you know, I think black spruce expansion here just made the landscape more flammable and we're seeing more fires occurring. And if you contrast that to sort of the last 3000 years, what you can see is climate actually cooled and moistened. So it's much wetter at the top of the core than it was earlier on. And what do we see? Well, we see a lengthening of fire return intervals. Uh, and then importantly, we see that the charcoal peaks themselves are starting to get bigger and magnetics are increasing. And so maybe it's conceivable that, you know, the, the lengthening of, of the fire return interval is allowing more fuel to build up. Uh, and then when the fires do burn under optimal conditions, you know, they're more severe and or larger. So, so, you know, in this pollen record from the Yukon, there are subtle changes in fire regime and vegetation over the last 6,000 years. But if you really want to understand sort of boreal sensitivity to climate change, we, we have to go back further to the Pliocene. The Pliocene is a geological epoch that occurred between 5 million and 2.5 and million years ago. I was invited by an international team to reconstruct the vegetation and fire history at this very well-known site, Beaver Pond on Ellesmere Island. Uh, that's rich in vertebrate fossils, bear, deer, rabbit, beaver, and more, as well as invertebrates, insects, and mollusks. And here's a perfectly preserved larch cone embedded in the peat here. Um, and so I joined that team, and I just want to sort of set the stage here now. So modern CO2, as of last month, is 423 parts per million. I showed the same slide last year in February of 2023 and CO2 was 419. So we've gone up like three or four parts per million in one year. And that's the rate at which CO2 is now uh, increasing in the atmosphere. But under, under uh, CO2 at about 423, Eureka, which is a small hamlet on the island, has a 
sort of mean summer temperature of about four degrees. If we go back to the Pliocene, CO2 based on stomata leaf density, uh, boron isotopes and alkanoids has been estimated to range somewhere between 400 and 450 parts per million, which is very similar to present day. So the Pliocene is a very good like climatic CO2 analog for what the future may look like, given that the CO2 concentrations are the same. So, you know, our team, we had people that were using thermal, thermal, thermal luminescence dating to age the sequence. There was a Dutch group that were using these bacterial membrane lipids. So these fatty acids, uh, which are very, so the structure of a fatty acid or a lipid is sensitive to temperature. And if it's hotter, it will have a certain type of structure. If it's colder, it will have a certain type of structure. So they've been able to use these membrane lipids to reconstruct temperature. I did the pollen for vegetation, the charcoal for fire. And what, what the Dutch, call, what our Dutch colleagues found was the mean temperature was about 15, summer temperature was about 15 degrees Celsius, whereas today it's four. So do we have 10 degrees more Arctic warming just because we're sitting at 423? And if this level keeps going up, you know, it's going to increase even more, right? When I did the pollen and the charcoal, here's the pollen, some of the pollen I was pulling out and just close your eyes and listen to these names and you'll say, hey, that's a boreal uh, taxa, right? Pine, spruce, larch, birch, vaccinium, blueberry, um, epilobium, fireweed, you know? So basically what we were showing is in the past when CO2 was similar to present, but temperatures were warmer. We, and you have to appreciate, like we put all the CO2 in the atmosphere within a hundred years. So that's gonna play out through time here, the effects of that, right? But in the past, when CO2 was similar to present, the Canadian Arctic supported boreal forest and some of the charcoal counts are some of the highest I've ever seen, it was burning. Um, so now I just wanna quickly turn our attention with the little bit of time I have left and hopefully I have enough to, to do this. Um, I'll just really plow through this for the sake of time and questions. But we've been working uh, with the Capital Regional District. This is a picture of the Souk Lake Reservoir. It's the drinking water supply for 400,000 people on uh, Vancouver Island. And the water gets, it's high quality water, but it gets minimal treatment um, because it's high quality. So a little bit of UV to kill bacteria, viruses and parasites, and a little bit of chloride to keep bacterial counts down while it's being distributed. It's high quality because as you can see in this photo, the watershed is forested. And so the water purveyors rely on, on forests and forest soils to uh, filter and purify the water. Um, but with climate change, these forests are going to change and the fire regime is going to change. So all of a sudden fire becomes a threat to this drinking water and we want to understand what that means. So the CRD asked me to come in and reconstruct vegetation history and tell them how the vegetation has changed through time in response to climate forcing. And this is again, just a pollen diagram, age and species with you know this period when climate was, was warm and dry in the past, lots of fire adapted species implying lots more fire when climate was warm and dry. And then you know the development of the modern sort of dry rain shadow forests over the last few thousand years. Um, and this big peak in charcoal, I just wanted to point that out, that could be indigenous burning. So we did this and we told them that, yeah, under past warm, dry conditions, you know, you had this type of sort of fire regime with maybe frequent, it was a mixed fire regime, frequent surface fires because the landscape opened up and supported more grasslands and occasional burning and a lot more sort of fire adapted taxa in contrast to present day. So as climate changes, maybe we go back to these types of conditions. Then as we were having these discussions, I had this idea that, well, we've reconstructed the fire history so we can actually go in and dissect these charcoal peaks and look at the conditions before the fire, during the fire and after the fire at very high resolution. So we brought in a PhD student, Nicholas Hebda, who did a great job. He, you know, we chose five fire events. He dissected them before the fire, during the fire and after the fire at high resolution to look at terrestrial and aquatic impacts of the fire and recovery. And I'm just gonna, you so, so I'm not gonna show all the events, just one. So you can see here in the middle of this diagram that some curves are going up and others are going down. Charcoal is going up, magnetics is going up, N15 reflective of a high severity fire is going up, carbon is decreasing. So we suspect that there was a fire here. Um, 
And so then we wanted to say, okay, well, what was the response to this fire? So we did pollen analyses. And one of the things we did with the pollen then, so here's our inferred fire event, is Nicholas went about doing a stratigraphically constrained cluster analyses, which groups samples that are least dissimilar or altern alternatively most similar. And it's an iterative process. So it just go through, it says what two samples are least dissimilar, let's group those, do it again. And you build up this dendrogram of dissimilarity. And when you look at this dendrogram, you can see that these samples are less dissimilar. These samples are, are less dissimilar or more similar. And these samples are more similar. So what we think we're seeing is the pre-fire baseline reference conditions, the fire impact zone, and the post-fire. So what did we see when we looked at you know, changes in mean? Well, we see Western Hemlock, for example, in the pre-fire uh, you know, it's sitting here, the fire knocks it down, it's a fire sensitive species, then it starts to recover. Pinus contorta across that fire zone, it actually increased and then recovered. That might be because it, you know, it was an early serial colonizer, or as we removed vegetation due to the fire, the regional pine rain came in. We did the same analyses for trace elements. And so there's our inferred fire event, there's the dendrogram, and you can see the fire impact zone lines up quite nicely with the fire impact zone. Uh, determined by the pollen. So pre-fire trace elements, fire trace elements, post-fire trace elements. And what did we see? Well, we see elements like magnesium, calcium, sodium, different cations, which are associated with wildfire ash. They increase in the fire zone and then start trending back towards background. And elements of concern like chromium, we also you know, looked at um, lead, arsenic, iron, which can impact the aesthetics of water, they increased around the fire event, statistically significant increases before decreasing. Um, and also carbon, it decreased across the fire event as, as fuel was removed before increasing and sulfur, which is associated with organic materials showed a similar trend. And then we also did diatoms to look at aquatic um, impacts. There's our fire event, our dendrogram, uh, how it how it partitioned out uh, quantitatively due to that dendrogram. And what did we see? Well, diatoms are freshwater algae and what they're photosynthetic. Uh, some are benthic, some are planktonic, but they have a, a silica shell and, and are known as a frustral. And when they die, that shell accumulates in the sediment. So we went in and we identified the shells. And one of the interesting things we were looking at was this ratio of planktonic to benthic. So because they're photosynthetic, the benthic ones at the bottom of the lake you know, if the water, if there's a lot of erosion post fire and the water becomes more murky, these benthic photosynthetic uh, uh, diatoms are going to get hammered and killed, whereas the planktonic ones may survive more. So, if that was the process that happened, you'd expect the planktonic benthic ratio to skew positive. And indeed, in the fire event, it does so, and it does so significantly before starting to recover as the water cleared and diversity increased. So, just last slide here what did we find in all the fire events we looked at? We saw evidence of terrestrial and aquatic impacts. Some fires, the, the signal was very strong, implying high severity fires. Others, we saw sort of lower severity fires. Um, there were there were fluxes in trace elements. Some, you know, with potential health concerns uh, that could impact human health or change water aesthetics. Um, uh, certainly, evidence of increased turbidity and erosion, as as recorded in the benthic planktonic ratios, and. And importantly, we were able to show that these, these impacts can persist for decades. And so the, the CRD, the water purveyors are, you know, considering our results and they're proposing a potential water filtration system to handle future fire-induced impacts on drinking water, a billion dollar, billion dollar water filtration system. And our research is helping inform amongst other lines of evidence, of course, but it's helping inform sort of about fire impacts and the need for, for this sort of uh, facility. And I'll wrap it up there and uh, we can take any questions or anything. Thank you, Andre and Kendrick. Uh, that was a great presentation. Now let's move on to the questions. We'll have 10 minutes for the Q&A. While we're waiting for participants to finish typing their questions, let's take a moment to fill out the post-webinar survey. Uh, just give me one second here. I'm just gonna launch it. Uh, so there are two questions in their survey. You may need to scroll down to see the next question. So 
Sorry, do you want me to look at Q&A? Uh, it's fine, Kendrick. I will um, read it out for you to answer them. Just going to okay. give people like a oh, yeah. okay. another 30 seconds to fill the survey. All right, so we have one questions in the one question in the Q and A pod. Um, so it's saying thanks, guys. Andre, you prefer to the importance of scale in determining fire return interval. Do any of your sites show support for the Swedish ASIO model that fire frequency is an eco site attribute, not just a landscape attribute? Mm -hmm. I'm not familiar with the ASIO model, but uh, definitely if you look at the, the gradient, you know, from the the shrub step ecosystem to the uh, the lower ponders of pine, then uh, interior Douglas fir, and then the mountain spruce plateau, I I suspect that there is an eco site relationship there, especially with the grassland. And uh, Jill Harvey showed that in, in the caribou region. And uh, I mean, this is anecdotal because we haven't analyzed all our data from the Ponders of Pine and, and the um, bunch grass zone yet, but it definitely looks like uh, there was more prevalence of fire in these uh, grassland uh, forest ecotone. And I, you know, this is where actually uh, linking with the uh, um, the indigenous people will be quite important because we know uh, there's there's evidence that uh, the Shekopmuk people, for example, burnt in the like Dubois grasslands, and so you know it, it could be that that ecocide relationship is actually associated with the cultural burning that the indigenous people uh, did in the past. Thank you, Andre. Uh, next question for you guys: uh, Has the capital R D considered mitigating high severity fires? via reducing fuels as opposed to investing billions to retroactively mitigate effects with a treatment center? Uh, yes. So um, fuel treatments are going on. Um, and uh, so uh, in a, and, and, and sort of in addition to fuel treatments, uh, you know, there's been a lot of, uh, Dan Paracas did some burn uh, P3 modeling of fire probabilities and sort of showed where the highest probabilities of uh, fire were within the watershed. And, and then, you know, what we actually did with our paleo data is, you know, he identified areas with high burn probability and low burn probability. And so we went in because we've cored many sites in there and we were able to reconstruct sort of the historic fire return intervals and what we were able to sort of show is the areas that Dan identified as high burn probabilities actually have the shortest fire return intervals and areas with lower burn probabilities have fire return and higher, higher fire return intervals. And so we were able to use sort of the paleo record to validate that model output. But it is a combination. Um, they are doing fuel treatments, of course. You know, there's some concern about efficacy of those and if under you know really extreme conditions are they going to help so um in terms of preventing spread of fire and minimizing impact on water quality but their mandate of course is to make sure that there's a continual supply of high quality water um, to consumers so i think to be perfectly honest it's a two-pronged approach fuel treatments you know, and hard hitting by, let's say, BC Wildfire Service to really try and get fires out before they're problematic. But if they exceed those, um, uh, you know, barriers to fire growth, then maybe a, f a filtration system will be needed to keep water supply for the for the population. So it is a combination of both, and 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 and, and fuel treatments are going on on the landscape. Yeah. Thank you, Kendrick. Uh, last question for you guys. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, can this research inform forest management or indicate where priorities should be leaning? Yeah, I mean, Andre, maybe I'll start and then you can jump in. I'll just say like, 
you know, for some of the research that we've been doing in the interior of British Columbia, um, you know, what what we're basically showing in those records is that in the past when climate was warmer and drier, so in British Columbia, you know, we classify our ecosystems using this biogeoclimatic ecological classification system. Um, it captures sort of, it's based on climax vegetation and broad, broadly similar climates. Uh, and, and, and what we're showing, like, is that in the past when climate was just a couple degrees warmer, that in, in some of the sites we're working on, you're seeing like zone shifts from one zone to two, three, to two, three, or maybe even four zone shifts. So sort of dramatic ecological transformation um, that's occurring. And certainly, you know, I get calls from community foresters who kind of want to understand what the impacts of potential impacts of climate change are on their forests. And, you know, so we, we have discussions about, you know, available paleo records or going in and actually collecting cores to help inform them sort of about historic dynamics um, so that they can sort of understand their ranges of variabilities of their ecosystems and their responses of their ecosystems to past changes climate. And Andre, I'll let you maybe jump in there and say a few words. Yeah, well, I I think in the short term, you know, the the impact from a management perspective is make sure that that uh, before you do a, an action, whether it's a fuel management treatment or ecosystem restoration, that you look at the assumptions uh, critically. That that's quite important because you know when you look at the landscape of these dry forest uh, uh, areas in, in BC. Um, it's not just two by fours or fuel. You're dealing with some of the uh, ecosystems and species that are the most endangered in Canada. And so, you know, when you make a decision about lighting a match, um, it's really important that that you think about uh, what the implications are from a whole ecosystem perspective. Um, and and the other thing which is really important, I think, and like I was saying, this is a gap from our research perspective that. I think it's really in, in, important, uh, um, like Chi Fingney said, that you know it's walking two legs, sort of integrating indigenous knowledge uh, with science. And from that perspective, you know, it, it, I, I remember uh, listening to a, a, a chief in the U.S. talking about uh, what was the difference between prescribed burning and cultural burning, and the answer is pretty simple: it's culture. And so, you know, that that's something we need to remember because I, I hear a lot of people talking and selling prescribed burning uh, as if it's cultural burning, but that's not necessarily the case. And so, again, it's all these assumptions that I think we need to be very clear um, when we, we make a management uh, action. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Andre and Kendrick. Um, if there are no more questions, I would like to bring this session to a close. Thank you all for participating in our CIF electronic lectures. And once again, thank you very much to Andre and Kendrick for this great presentation. Bye, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, bye. Thank you.